Hi everyone. So in this video, my goal is to give you a general idea of what's going on in experiment 8, which is the reduction of a ketone. Namely, benzophenone. Benzophenone. Benzophenone is a ketone because it has a C double bond O here. We're going to turn that into an alcohol, diphenylmethanol, here. This is a reduction. The ketone has two bonds to oxygen. The alcohol has one bond to oxygen. We've reduced the bonds to oxygen. We've performed the reduction. This is the same as the reductions you've learned in general chemistry. Explained a little bit differently for organic, but it's the same thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to do this reaction in a very specific way so that we can monitor the reaction by TLC. Thin layer chromatography, you'll recall, is a separation technique where we take advantage of the polar stationary phase, silica gel, and a non-polar mobile phase, in this case you're going to use 5% uh, ethyl acetate in hexane, and basically you're going to, um, you're going to uh, develop these plates and monitor the reaction progress. Now, usually um, when chemists are using TLC to monitor reactions, they're relatively long reactions. This is a pretty quick reaction. So we have kind of artificially changed how we're doing it so that the, the monitoring um, can be done by TLC and it makes sense. And the reason for that is very simple. You have to get into lab, listen to the pre-lab pre lecture, um, you know, do, set everything up, work up the reaction, everything in three hours. That's not realistic for most reactions. However, we've developed this so that you can get a feel for it using the reaction that is um, feasible in that three hour time constraint. All right, so without further ado, let's get into it. It's, our, it's very difficult to decide what to do first, but what I'm gonna do first here is look at um, what we're doing in the reaction. So what is it you're actually gonna do? And then, after we have some idea of what's actually going on in the reaction, then we'll talk about things like the theoretical yield, the mechanism, um, the, uh, the hypothesis, uh, the separation scheme, all the stuff that you need for a pre-lab, uh, but let's talk about the reaction first. So we're taking benzophenone and we're forming diphenylmethanol. What we're essentially going to do is we're going to take one gram of benzophenone and 0.25 grams of sodium borohydride. And we're going to divide this uh, 0.25 grams of sodium hydride, borohydride into three equal portions. So visually, it doesn't need to be the exact same mass. You're just going to divide it up into three um, aliquots. And you're going to add those aliquots at different time intervals, that I'll explain in a second, throughout the reaction. And at each time interval, not only will you maybe, in most cases, be adding sodium borohydride, you will also be taking a um, TLC of that uh, reaction mixture at that time. So that's essentially what we're looking at here. So what I want to do is I want to draw the TLC plates and we'll go from there. So what I'm going to have eventually is six spots. The first spot is going to be benzophenone. So you're just going to have benzophenone. Um, you're going to uh, basically dissolve it and spot it onto the TLC plate. The next thing you're going to have is T equals zero. And what T equals zero means is sodium borohydride has not yet been added. So sodium borohydride is not going to be added at this point. So essentially, you're going to take your one gram of benzophenone, dissolve it in 15 milliliters or less of 95% ethanol, and then you're going to spot that. These should be identical because it shouldn't have any diphenylmethanol. Why should it have no diphenylmethanol? Because you haven't added any sodium borohydride. This isn't going to react with itself, right? You need to add the, the reactant in order for the reaction to occur. So therefore, you, you should probably, definitely, only see benzophenone. Then at this point, after we spot this, we're going to add, oops, add first, third. So what does that mean? The first one third portion of this 0.25 grams of sodium borohydride. So we're going to add the first third. After we take the spot, 
then we're going to wait 10 minutes. So this is t equals 10. And this time, you've added some sodium boral hydride. So after you've added some sodium boral hydride, the reaction will hopefully start. After 10 minutes, you're going to take the spot. After you take the spot, you're going to add the second, third. You're going to wait 10 more minutes. So T is going to equal 20. We could fit about three spots on a TLC plate, so we're going to go to a second TLC plate. So time equals 20. Then you're going to add the third third, which I understand doesn't make any sense. But you're going to add the third third of the sodium borohydride. So after you take the spot, you spot it. Then you take the third third. Then you're going to go to T equals 30. And finally, T equals 40. After you've added the third third, you've added all of it, so you're not going to add any more in subsequent uh, time intervals. You're simply just going to take a, a, a drop of the, of the reaction mixture and spot it on the TLC plate. So this is essentially um, what we're doing throughout this reaction. Now, we need to talk about what we're going to see. First thing I need to um, let you know is we are, I'm totally making this up. So the RFs, the relative distance between the solvent front and the spot um, will be relatively correct, but not absolutely correct. So just for the sake of argument, let's say that the benzophenone travels this far. And we see a single spot um, about this far, which has an RF, I don't know, 0.55 or something like that, maybe 0.6. So if the solvent front's up here. So basically, we're just going to, by default, say benzophenone travels this far. In time equals zero, benzo, this should be just benzophenone. We have not yet added any sodium boral hydride. So at time equals zero, in theory, and probably in practice, if we do it right, we should have a spot at the same point because it's just benzophenone. So the RF is the same. Now, after we take this spot, we add our first third of our rea other reactant, sodium boral hydride. So what's going to happen? Well, the reaction hopefully will start to occur. And from my experience, I know it will start to occur. So after we've added the sodium boral hydride, some, but not all, of the benzophenone will be reacted to form uh, diphenylmethanol. Now, you wouldn't know this, but I know it from experience, that 10 minutes is long enough to get an appreciable amount of this, so enough that we can see a spot. So we haven't reacted all the benzophenone, so we still have a spot for benzophenone because there's still plenty of benzophenone left. All right, we've only added a third of this, which isn't enough to get the reaction to complete completion, and I'm not sure if 10 minutes is enough to get the reaction to completion either. I haven't tested that. So we have not completely formed this. We still have benzophenone but we're also going to have diphenylmethanol. Now, I am making up where this is. It may not be here exactly on your TLC plate, and don't freak out if it's not. I'm just making it up. But what we can talk about is where is diphenylmethanol going to be relatively? Well, what we need to know is, well, we're using 95% hexanes as our eluding solvent that's going to flow up that's right, we're going to put this in a beaker and the hexanes are going to flow up through the silica gel. And we're using 5% ethyl acetate. Ethyl acetate is polar, but it's still immiscible with water. This has a distinctive smell that you could find in nail polish and stuff like that, so you may recognize it. So this molecule is somewhat polar. Hexanes, nonpolar, right? It's just a six carbon chain. So you have a relatively nonpolar moldable phase. Silica gel is polar. Well, let's look at the relative polarity of a ketone versus an alcohol. An alcohol is more polar. Why is an alcohol more polar? Well, it has an O bonded to an H as opposed to an O just bonded to a C. This can hydrogen bond, first of all, to itself and to silica gel. This could hydrogen bond to silica gel, but not to itself. This molecule also has a greater dipole moment between hydrogen and oxygen than between oxygen and carbon. So this molecule is more polar. Well, if it's more polar, it's going to stick more to the polar silica gel, 
which means it's not going to travel as far. So now we're going to get a second spot, and that second spot is going to have a lower RF than benzophenone. Why? Because diphenylmethanol is more polar, and it sticks more strongly to the nonpolar silica gel. So this is what we should see. After we do the spot, we add the second portion. At time equals 20, we should see the same thing. We haven't completely reacted the benzophenone, and therefore uh, we still have some diphenylmethanol that we've formed, but we have some benzophenone left over, so we see two spots. Time equals 30. I'm not 100% sure what's going to happen at time equals 30. For some of you, you might see just diphenylmethanol. For others of you, you may continue to see both spots. By time equals 40, the benzophenone should be reacted completely, meaning that you may have a tiny amount of it left, but not very much, not enough that you're going to see a spot. So you should see just diphenylmethanol. And here, you may see just diphenylmethanol as well at time equals 30. Depends. Okay, so this is essentially what we're going to do. We're going to do this reaction in such a way that we can monitor it by TLC. This, if you don't know how long a reaction is going to take, is very important. If you see just starting material, just benzophenone, in your reaction mixture, you know the reaction hasn't even started, like at time equals zero. This may be, unfortunately, if you're doing some kind of research reaction, at time equals three hours. You might see just starting material. That tells you that this reaction isn't even started. So maybe it's going to take three days, or maybe you need to try another reaction. At time equals 10 here, you can see you have both uh, starting material and product, which means the reaction is going, right? You form some product, but you still have some starting material left over. So if you're making a decision, what should you do? Well, let's try to let this reaction make sure go longer. Of course, it could be at equilibrium and time will not help you, but it's worth a shot. We continue to see both starting material and product, starting material and product. And then finally, we see just product. At this point, we know we should stop the reaction mixture. Why? Because there's no more starting material. You're not going to make any more product without any more starting material. So I hope it's clear um, what we're trying to accomplish here. As far as the physical stuff that you need to do, this is a fairly straightforward reaction. You're going to dissolve this in less than 15 milliliters of 95% ethanol into in a 50 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask, and you're going to stir it. Okay, so you're just going to put it on a stir plate, and you're going to stir it. Then you're going to add these at the prescribed intervals uh, shown below, a third of this at the prescribed intervals shown below, and you're going to monitor the reaction progress by TLC. You're going to develop the TLC plates by putting um, a small amount of the 95% hexanes and the 5% ethyl acetate in the bottom of a beaker. You're going to put the TLC plate down into it such that the level is lower than the spots, and you're going to allow time to and capillary action to draw the solvent up through the uh, TLC plate until it gets to the top. You're then going to be able to take these out, dry them off, and use a, a UV lamp uh, to visualize your spots. So that is essentially the uh, experimental procedure of this reaction. Now that we've talked about the experimental procedure, I don't know where to go next, but where I'm going to go next is with the theoretical yield. So what we have here is one gram of benzophenone and 0.25 grams of sodium borohydride. Now in an effort to not directly exactly tell you um, the uh, answer to this, so you could just essentially copy it from the video, I'm going to use different numbers. These are the numbers you are going to use in the lab. So these are the correct numbers. What I'm going to use, just for something I made up 10 minutes ago, is 2.4 grams of benzophenone and 1.8 grams of sodium borohydride when I do my example calculations. Your calculations are going to be exactly the same, but with different numbers. Writing out these calculations and learning how to do limiting reagent theoretical yield, if you don't already know how to do it by now, it's a good idea to remind yourself now. So let's do the theoretical yield using the made up numbers. So the first thing that we want to do is we
we want to figure out how many grams of diphenylmethanol we can make with all of our benzophenone. Now, just for simplicity, I'm gonna abbreviate this as benzo. I'm gonna abbreviate this as boro. And I'm gonna abbreviate this as diphenylmethanol. Just so I don't have to write them out all the, every time, the whole words. So this is basically what we're gonna do. So in order to figure out how much diphenylmethanol we can make from our benzophenone, we need to do stoichiometry. If you look closely at this, you're gonna find out that it's gonna be of almost the same amount. Why? Because the only difference between this molecule and this molecule is two protons. There's an extra proton here and an extra proton here, meaning they have almost the same molar mass, right? This is two more than this, which means you're gonna get about the same amount. But let's do the math just so we know. So we wanna convert from grams of benzophenone to moles of benzophenone to moles of diphenylmethanol to grams of diphenyl methanol. Now again, I'm using 2.4 in my example. You're gonna use one gram in the lab. So 2.4 grams of benzophenone times, we wanna to convert to moles using the molar mass. Well, the molar mass of benzophenone is 182.22. So we're gonna put that on the bottom, 128.22 grams of benzo. And on top, one mole of benzo. Now, we want to convert it to moles of diphenylmethanol. To convert from moles of one thing to moles of another, you need a balanced chemical equation. And there's a four to four relationship. So four moles of benzo on the bottom, because I want that to cancel out, over four moles of diphenylmethanol on the top. Times, now I want to convert it to grams of diphenylmethanol, so I need to use the molar mass of diphenylmethanol. And as I mentioned a minute ago, it's very similar to the molar mass of benzophenone. It's two more because it only has two additional protons. So we want to put one mole of diphenylmethanol on the bottom and on top the molar mass, which is 184.23 grams of diphenylmethanol on the top. Multiply by the top, divide by the bottom, multiply by the top, divide by the bottom, repeat, repeat till the end, and you get 2.4 to the two significant figures of diphenyl methanol. So they came out exactly the same to two significant figures. Of course, if you went to more digits, um, they would be slightly different because the molar mass did change, uh, but it's very close. So that's to be expected. Now you want to repeat this exact same thing with borohydride. So you want to go from grams of borohydride to moles of borohydride to moles of diphenylmethanol to grams of diphenylmethanol, just like that. So again, in the lab, you're going to use 0.25. In this uh, video, I'm going to use 1.8. So that's that. So starting with 1.8 grams of sodium borohydride times, this time I want the molar mass of sodium borohydride, which happens to be 37.23 grams of sodium borohydride, which I'm abbreviating boro, per one mole of sodium borohydride. Next, we want to convert to moles of diphenylmethanol, balanced chemical equation. There's a one to four relationship. So I put the one mole of borohydride, sodium borohydride on the bottom, because I want borohydride to cancel out. And I put four moles of diphenylmethanol on the top. So four to one. Finally, grams of diphenylmethanol. Good news, last step is the same, because I'm going from moles of diphenylmethanol to grams, moles to grams, so it's the same, so same conversion factor. One mole of diphenylmethanol, per 184.23 grams of diphenyl methanol. When you do all that math, you find 36 grams of diphenyl methanol. Now, based on my made up numbers, the theoretical yield is 2.4 grams because that's lower, right? Once I make 2.4 grams of diphenyl methanol, I run out of benzophenone. So therefore, this is the theoretical yield. And the limiting reagent here is benzophenone. The limiting reagent is the chemical that leads to the theoretical yield. 
So that is basically a made up example using fake numbers, but you're going to do exactly the same thing, simply plugging in the real numbers at the beginning of these um, equations. So this is the theoretical yield. Next, I want to talk a, a bit about the mechanism of the reaction. So the mechanism of the reaction is important, and I want to show it here. So the first thing we have is we have benzophenone, which looks like this. And before we talk about benzophenone and what happens to benzophenone in this reaction, I want to talk about sodium borohydride. So it's NaBH4. So essentially what we have is we have a B with four H's on it, like this. And if we look at the formal charge here, we have a boron, which wants to have three electrons around it, and it has one, two, three, four, so it's negatively charged. And that's, there's a sodium, the Na plus is the counter ion to this negatively charged uh, boron. Now, if we look here, a lot of times when we see proto uh, H's on things, we think of proton donors, acids. But let's look at what would happen to bor borohydride if it donated a proton. So this doesn't happen, but I just want to show what it would happen. If borohydride donates a proton, this proton goes somewhere, and these lone pairs would come here. And what you'd end up with is boron with a lone pair and three hydrogens. This does not happen, but I'm just explaining what is going on. So you'd end up with this boron with a lone pair and uh, the three hydrogens because the H would leave and the two electrons in the covalent bond would come and become a lone pair. Let's look at the formal charge of this. One, two, three, four, five. Boron wants um, three electrons around it and it has five. Minus two. This is bad. So borohydride is not an acid. It's not going to donate a proton. What it's going to do donate essentially is hydride or H minus because it wants to uh, hydrogen to take those electrons with it. If hydrogen takes those electrons with it, as you'll see, this becomes neutral. So what happens is this H has electrons. So if you have an H with electrons, what's it going to attack? It's going to attack something that doesn't have electrons. What part of this molecule has the least electrons? This carbon of the carbonyl group. Why? Because I could draw this electron pair going up here. And that would put a partially positive charge on this, or it'd make a resonance form with a positive charge on this and a minus charge on this, or said another way, this has a partially positive charge. So this H with its electrons attack there, and this goes there. And what I end up with is A negative charge on oxygen and if you want this has three lone pairs now before if I probably should have drawn them it had two so now this is a minus charge and I end up with BH3 which you could write like this or you could just write it as BH3 so this is basically what I end up with well if we look at this molecule this is essentially an alcohol without a proton and an alcohol without a proton is a pretty strong base. And if we have a lot of protic solvent around, in this case we have 95% ethanol and 5% water, both of which are protic solvents, I'm going to use ethanol as the proton source because it's 95% ethanol. You could use water as the proton source and argue it's a much stronger uh, acid than ethanol. In either case, I'm not sure what the right answer is, but there's sources of protons in the solution. So this wants a proton. This has a proton. It takes it. This then goes there, and I guess I should put the two lone pairs on this, and what we end up with is diphenylmethanol, because now this has the proton. 
and we end up with CH3 C H2 O which now has three lone pairs and a minus charge and what happens is you don't necessarily need to draw this but this goes there because boron has an empty orbital right it doesn't have an octet so it has an empty orbital which can which can um, accept this and at the end of the day what you end up with is BH3 O CH2 CH3 boron now has three more H's capable of acting as hydrides which is why you can react four of these molecules with one of the boral hydride. So this molecule, this would be minus an Na plus technically, um, this molecule is capable of doing a reduction. Why is it a reduction? Why can boral hydride do a reduction? Because it's a source of H minus which attacks the carbonyl carbon. Then this molecule becomes very basic and takes a proton from something and you end up with an alcohol. This had two bonds to oxygen. This has one bond to oxygen. That's a reduction. That is the mechanism of this reaction. And again, you don't really need this step. You could just uh, basically leave this out and go directly to this. Uh, so here you'd have plus pH3, and here you'd have plus NaPH3, OCH2, CH3. This is the mechanism of the reaction. The next thing I want to talk about is the separation scheme. So we already discussed earlier how we're going to do this reaction, but we didn't discuss how we're going to work up the reaction at the end of the reaction. So after we've done all of our TLC samples and we essentially have seen that we have all product at the end of the reaction, we're going to work up the reaction. To work up the reaction, we're going to add cold water and place the fl flask in an ice bath. Benzophenone, or excuse me, diphenylmethanol has lots and lots of um, carbon groups relative to the 1OH group. So this molecule is not very soluble in a mixture of ethanol and water. When we cool it down, this molecule should simply precipitate out of solution and form a solid. So what you're going to end up with is this following separation scheme. Note that separation schemes start when the reaction is over. You don't want to start the separation scheme before the reaction is over. Why? Because you're, the goal of the separation is to separate the product, right, the molecule we care about, in this case diphenylmethanol, from all the other stuff in the reaction mixture. So this is, um, it's very important that at the top of your separation scheme, you have the product. So the first thing we're going to have in our separation scheme is diphenyl methanol. This one's arguable, but we'll, might have some trace benzophenone. There's two cases for no benzophenone. One is that you, um, it's a limiting reagent, and the second is that you have TLC data that doesn't show a spot for benzophenone anymore. So whether there's trace benzophenone or not, there almost definitely is at least a mo some molecules of benzophenone. How much there is, arguable, uh, to satisfy that, rewrite the word trace. Unfortunately, when it comes to separation schemes and to a lot of this stuff, it's like writing a paper. There's no one right answer, right? You can't, there's no one good paper and then all the rest are wrong. Um, it's not a math question. So whether it's there or not, I'm not sure. All right, the, ne the next thing you're gonna have is the stuff you used to make the reaction work. Water, which we uh, is 95% ethanol, so it's 5% water to begin with, plus we added some more water to precipitate out the diphenylmethanol, and it's 95% ethanol, so we have the solvent ethanol, which also is involved in the reaction mixture, right? It's the source of protons. So these are the things we have there. Also, we have some kind of boron stuff. Okay, in this case, this is what we're um, showing as our boron salt. Who knows what we actually have? So I'm just going to write that as boron salt. You could also write it as sodium borohydride salt. It doesn't matter. Okay, so I'm just going to write that as boron salt. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to add the water, and we're going to cool this thing down, and we're going to end up with a precipitate, and then we're going to vacuum 
uh, vacuum filter our precipitate. And there are different ways to do this. You could write this as solid and aqueous. You could write it as solid and filtrate. I'm going to put the solid here. I'm going to put filtrate here. If you write this as aqueous, that's fine too because water is a solvent. So what is going to be end up on our filter paper and be a solid? Hopefully just diphenylmethanol. For the reasons we talked about before, diphenylmethanol is mostly nonpolar. It's not very soluble in a cold mixture of ethanol and water. So it precipitates out, then we filter it. What's going to end up in the filtrate? Hopefully everything else. The trace benzophenone, and as long as it's very trace amount, it should stay soluble in water. If the reaction didn't work and you were to see a bunch of benzophenone, as evidenced by TLC, then maybe it wouldn't um, all stay in the, in the uh, aqueous solution. But when there's only a tiny bit and there's a bunch of ethanol there, it probably stays in there. Water is of course in our filtrate, that's liquid. Ethanol is a liquid, so that's gonna be in our filtrate. And the boron salts should stay dissolved in the aqueous solution. So a relatively simple um, separation scheme here, uh, but it is very important um, that you have the separation schemes um, and they're not all this uh, straightforward. Finally, I wanna talk briefly about the hypothesis. And this is right out of the lab manual. It says, focus on the type of reaction used to form the product, how the reaction will be monitored for completion, and how the purity of the product will be assessed. So I've already um, talked quite extensively about how the reaction used to form the product is a reduction reaction, and how we're gonna use TLC to monitor the reaction for completion. So I wanna talk here about how the product, uh, the purity of the product will be assessed. So one of the things you're gonna to do to assess the purity of the product is TLC. If you don't see a spot for benzophenone, that's a good indication that the product is pure. Another thing you're gonna do for uh, determining the purity of the product is melting point. And the melting point of benzophenone that I just looked up is 48.5 degrees C. And the melting point of diphenylmethanol is 69 degrees C. So when you take your melting point, hopefully it'll be close to 69 degrees C and it'll have a narrow range. I wouldn't be shocked if your um, molecule didn't have uh, a super narrow range just because it's gonna be wet with ethanol and water. So you wanna dry it the best you can uh, before you take the melting point. The finally, what you're gonna do is infrared spectroscopy. And if we look at the um, IR spectra here, which were obtained from the NIST chemistry web book. I just zoomed out a little bit so you can see them a little bit better. We can look at the um, benzophenone and the um, uh, diphenylmethanol. They call it benzhydrol, but it's the same thing. So what we want to do is we want to look at the distinct peaks. So let me remind you again, benzophenone is a ketone with two aromatic rings and diphenylmethanol is an alcohol. So if we look here, in the benzophenone's peak, peak, we have a peak around 1700, which is from C double bond O. And these are from CH aromatic. If we look at the, um, the diphenylmethanol, this has CH aromatic, but it also has NOH. It does not, if you look, I tried to line these up as best I could, it does not have that strong C double bond O peak. So you can see that it does not have that strong C double bond O peak. So the absence of the carbonyl tells us that we converted it to the alcohol. I don't expect you guys to do this, but you need to think about your solvent here. Your solvent is ethanol and water, and you haven't rigorously dried your product. So the presence of an OH is not as strong of evidence that you've converted the, completed this reaction because both ethanol and water have OH groups. So therefore the OH peak could be from the ethanol or the water. The lack of C double bond O though is pretty conclusive proof that you no longer have benzophenone and now you have diphenylmethanol. So I hope this video gives you a good idea of uh, what you're trying to perform in experiment eight. And I hope it uh, makes things a little bit more clear as you're writing your pre-lab, performing your experiment, and uh, things like that. Thanks for watching.